Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Ira Fay, Kelly Santiago, Ken Weber, and Dan White II. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ira Fay. I'm an assistant professor of game design at Quinnipiac University and also uh, the founder of Fay Games, uh, one of the few game development studios in Connecticut. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome the three judges for the Demo Spotlight presentation. Uh, Kelly Santiago was the co-founder of that game company who developed Flow, Flower, and Journey. She is also now a partner in Indie Fund, supporting indie developers. <laughs> Ken Weber is the executive director of Zynga.org, focused on social impact at Zynga, including their players, their platform, and also their employees. And Dan White is a founding partner and also the CEO at Filament Games, a game development studio focused on learning games. Dan is also on the Games for Change advisory board. And I hope you all had a chance to read the program, but if you haven't, I want to tell you briefly about the demo spotlight. Um, I had the opportunity to review all of the submissions to the Demo Spotlight, and I have to tell you, there are incredible games that are being done and created in this space. And the four that you're going to see today are really exemplars of the breadth and depth in the impact game space. So uh, the format for today will be that each of the game developers will come out, give a five minute presentation on the games that they're working on, and then the judges and the presenters will have a 10 minute Q&A, and then we're gonna repeat that four times. So, first up is Ed Z Omega, an alternate reality game addressing school dropouts. I'd like to welcome Ken Eklund, also known as Writer Guy, who is a designer you might know from World Without Oil. Ken. Our game is funded. We launch at the start of the fall semester, so um, August 15th. We're looking for help getting the word out about the game. Uh, we're looking for ways to get people curious about it and maybe a little more underwriting. Um, this game is a public media project. My partners are Twin Cities Public Television and the Association for Independence and Radio. So think of it as a documentary, a transmedia documentary about education. In our fiction, there's this expression, Z Omega. It means so over. When you go Z Omega, you are done. Ed Z Omega means we are done with education. Specifically, Ed Z Omega is six Minneapolis teens dropping out of high school. But a guidance counselor named Mary Johnson strikes a deal with them one last semester of self directed study, crowdsourced study about education. So here are our teens. Six teens dropping out loud on Facebook and YouTube. They're asking you, what worked for you in high school? What did it give you beside a diploma? What is high school supposed to do? Collaborate with these teens on a little learning triage. Just friend them on Facebook and you've mastered the game platform. Now this is not a web series. This is all real time and unscripted. So here's the game challenge. Can you make this turn out right? These kids may be fictional, but there are a million kids this year who are dropping out for real, just as there were a million kids last year and will be a million kids next year until we straighten some things out. You may not be able to help a million kids. In the real world, you lack agency, but you have agency with Ed Z Omega. You can change their world. Plus, uh, these are teens. There will be drama. Of course there will be drama. So how does this play? A lot like a conversation. Say you're on the Ed Dead Tumblr, just following along because they are teens and there is capital D drama, when one of them, Edwina, Edwina links to an email she got from a lady named Jessie. Now this all started when, as you know, Edwina just said no to her high school diploma and someone texted her and said, no, don't do it. A high school diploma is valuable. And Edwina wondered why. And there was a lot of discussion. And then, as I said, Jessie wrote in. And she said, well, Edwina, it proves you can stick with something. So Edwina points to Jessie's email and says, yes. 
and being able to stick with what you're told to do is valuable for some jobs and some people. But what are those are not the jobs that I want to have? And what if that is not who I am? Edwina says, I worry bottom line, this is like hazing. I went through it, and so, so must you. Okay, so once you see that, I mean, you are moved to respond. I mean, come on. And you say, well, what do you say? I don't know what you say, but you probably do. It may be starting to play out in your head at this very moment. And if so, you are feeling our game engine at work. Now we have six characters, we run a whole semester, so we're looking at potentially thousands of little teachable moments like this. We can curate this really great collection. As a player, you know you're building what I call an authentic fiction. True because it's crowdsourced and it's unscripted. So curating is our game mechanic. Behind the scenes, we score these contributions, we reward good play with attention, we change the game state, and so on. But really, talking with a fictional character is a great natural play state. Put those two together, and you've got a narrative game for a demographic not traditionally served by Games for Change, non-gamers. Can we get a dialogue going about education which is not stuck in the past? Can we include teens, make them the focal point even? It seems to me that we have a shortcoming in the way we do education. One million kids a year is a symptom that we can't ignore, but we do. We're like fish, and school fail is like bad water. And I don't mean just mean fail as in drop out. I mean fail as in high school is something that most young people tolerate or survive. The first step is to feel the problem, to make it human and personal uh, by chatting with it on Facebook. An alternate reality game about the future of uh, education, um, Ed Z Omega. So what do you think? Are you going to play? Um, thanks. I guess um, my first question for you is about distribution. So you said you're looking for follow-up funding, and if that dream came true, what happens next? How do you get this broad and wide? It looks like there's some social elements in here. Is that what you leverage? So I mean, it's an alternate reality game which will run this fall semester. And as part of essentially the funding that we've got from uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, what we're trying to do is create a model which other organizations can adapt for their own purposes. So we're not necessarily, I mean, I, I would love to be able to run it every year. I think that would be great. That's not really in the cards right now. Um, we'll kind of have to see what happens with the game. But even more than that, I would love to see people go, oh, this would be great for addressing this other issue, um, you know, something else in that. Kind of any issue, I think, which is bigger than one person can kind of get their heads around uh, is a candidate, which we have a couple of those, you know, um, as a candidate for this. I just want to follow up question. Um, when you're trying to pitch a game to somebody and get them interested and get them to play, uh, particularly a, a teen or a high school student, you have a relatively abstract title which you had to explain. So there's the first 10 seconds of your elevator pitch. You got another 10 seconds. So how would you explain this to me if I was a high school student in the next 10 seconds to get me interested and involved in this? Oh, well, I, I would just say this is uh, a game which e the end product is going to make high school suck less. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the outputs from the game? Um, given your funders and given your use of the word transmedia, what, what do you hope to do with the content? So I, I should just mention, although you know, um, my partners are radio and television, there is no radio component and there is no television component. And that is quite deliberate. Um, uh, public media knows that they need to think about transmedia work, um, about, about getting out of their traditional and so that is, I mean, this, the output for this is, is the collection of what will, the discussions that will happen, which will all be on Facebook. And then we also have a mechanism by which we just scoop that all in. So that on the Ed Z Omega site, you know, there are links to kind of all of these different threads. It's curated. Yeah, I was wondering about that aspect as well, because I thought um, that certainly a great byproduct of this project is going to be 
the potential for an artifact, you know, to publish or use as a resource for other documentary programming um, around not just high school students today, but how other gener you know, previous generations have felt about their, their high school experience, right, with this interaction of, well, why should I even go to school? And I'd imagine it would be interesting to engage people of different generations about what, what the, their answers are to that question. Um, and then you were just talking about sort of help with, with spreading the word. And so just to that point, I thought uh, the presentation was pretty good, but there's some areas where your messaging could be just tightened a little bit um, because you want to really give that, um, that journalist or that potential advocate for, for your game a really easy way to understand what the hook is. And I thought it took a little while to get what to, to the problem that you introduced about that, that statistic of how many students are dropping out today, right? And I thought that would be better to just start with that because that's such an engaging moment. Um, and, uh, and I liked the part where you talked about the player experience um, with Edwina and then it, then it led to um, explaining your game engine. I thought that was a very um, clear, concise moment of the presentation that, that you should totally use. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's funny, working on the game for a long time, uh, essentially the, the teens that we're working with were the sort of abstract thing. We knew we were gonna hire people. But now we've actually hired some people. And so it's amazing to kind of see how that is really coming together. I haven't had them on staff long enough to really kind of use that resource. Mm -hmm. But I think that really addresses kind of a lot of the, once they begin talking, then you know, kind of what I say is, is almost immaterial. Uh, that authentic <laughs> thing just kind of comes through pretty quickly. Mm. What would you consider if you were to put forth a metric for success for this project yeah. over the next five years, what would that be? Well, I, I um, the, the next five years, it would be the number of games like it, um, uh, if I've done it again, and uh, et cetera. I think the metric for this particular game is if I can get 30 people uh, sending stuff in, uh, links, uh, opinions, and that sort of thing a day, then I think that that will have generated you know, the necessary, that would be a really robust collection of information um, about education, uh, of opinions about education. Um, and do you, do you have a bottom-up strategy for achieving that number, that 30 a day? Uh, strategy, me, no. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the, the field testing that I do is I talk to people about the game. And when I've been talking to people about Ed Z Omega, they instantly launch into a personal story about education, about where this touches their lives, because it's you know, their, their son, their daughter, um, or, or their own experience in high school. I was describing it to someone uh, out in the lobby, and the person standing by just said, oh, by the way, I dropped out of high school. Or I, I would have dropped out of high school, except that the teacher actually cheated so that I would get my diploma. And then I dropped out of college, and now I'm a CEO of my own company. And so I think a big part of the game and the spread of the game is that, um, tapping into that. If we can do that successfully, then I think the engine of participation is really going to work very well for us. I was interested in your use of the phrase, you know, game for non-gamers. I'm probably a, still a non-gamer uh, relative to my colleagues up here. Um, I mean, you know, there's the elevator pitch is also the first time user experience. And, how important is it that people understand it's a game, or is it just a thing that you know they're going to interact with, and contribute content to? How how how, how is it going to be clear, you know, to, to players how to play? The thing that we're going to make clear is that you're talking to fictitious, you're talking to fictional characters. So we need to be very open about that. We don't want to hoax anyone, you know, not right. for more than five seconds. But then, the cognitive structure that they use to kind of understand what is going on. Um, uh, is, is it kind of entirely up to them? I'm not interested in dictating what that might be. Uh, the word game is going to be something which I avoid using out in the real world because I want to be inclusive of gamers and that can be just a negative word for a lot of people. They just go, they associate the word game with time waste. Um, but that wouldn't be the way that they would really think about this project if they got involved. Can so a thought experiment or a social experiment. Yeah. 
Can you say a little bit more about, you don't want to dictate, but you did say curate? Is it going to be user curated? Are you going to have a, I mean, teenagers are narcissists, right? So it could easily turn into like a version of American Teenager, which is a great, great film that everybody should see. But um, are, how, how much of an editorial role do you expect to play? Um, very little. And that is kind of by design. The structure of this, I mean, the people that I'm hiring, I'm giving them tremendous freedom. And uh, I think part of what I want to do with an authentic fiction is not to make it some reflection of what I believe. And so my job really is to just sit and not believe anything, but look at things as they come in and just go, wow, I just found that, I find this tremendously interesting. Let's put this you know, up where everyone can see it. So it's very inclusive, kind of everyone's stuff is linked to. You know, it's a question of what you kind of call attention to. And that is just kind of an, an organic method. And there is essentially a, the capability for the audience to just completely ignore what we're, you know, we're like, oh, look at this great stuff. And they're going, no, this is just a beaver thing. So, and, that, and then you just go with that. Luke. One more question? If not, I thought that you guys covered it. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Ken. Sure. Thank you. So our next presenters are from Play Forward, Elm City Stories. It is an RPG for 11 to 14 year olds addressing all of life's challenges, including sex. Please welcome Sabrina Haskell, a senior game designer at Shell Games, and Kimberly Hefia, associate research scientist at Yale School of Medicine. Good afternoon. Uh, I just want to give a quick um, background and rationale to our project. 39% uh, of new HIV infections are among ages 13 to 29, and that's about a 21% increase, percent increase from 2006. Only 7% of adolescents under 13 have engaged in sexual activity. Therefore, 10 to 15 year olds may be an optimal, optimal window for opportunity for primary HIV prevention. The goal of our video game and the overall project is to develop and evaluate a game for young adolescents ages 11 to 14 to practice the skills needed to avoid or reduce risk behaviors. Um, the primary outcome is to delay sexual initiation, uh, therefore delay risk of HIV exposure. The team uh, working on this project, we have a partnership, a very unique partnership between uh, scientists, uh, content uh, matter experts, health behavior change experts, game developers, um, we're with Yale University School of Medicine, Digital Mill, and Shell Games. I'm going to talk really quickly about the four main parts of the game. We start with what we call the aspirational avatar, and that includes a physical, visual representation of the character, but also a visual collage of that character's future life, really the player's future life, what kind of car they want, what kind of house they want, what kind of job they want. And as the player fills in this visual collage, their aspirational avatar, they're earning me power, and that's one of our five skills in the game. We have four other skills, and each of them has a mini game associated with it that allows the player to practice so real social skills that they can use to navigate situations of risk in their real life. And we're gonna show a quick video from part of one of the games. So this is their How is game. This pressuring me? And the first thing we have the player do is identify what's the, what, how are they being manipulated by the words of the opponent here. And then they have to pick what way are they going to choose to say no, because there's lots of different ways to say no, depending on if you want to maintain the social relationship or be aggressive or be indirect. And then we have them construct an actual sentence that they could use in a similar situation in real life to say no to someone in this way. So all of our mini games are like this, where we're trying to represent the real process and, and thought process and follow through you need to, um, to refuse or get out of a risky situation or avoid a risky situation in real life. The way that those skills then fold back into the rest of the game is the story of the game. So there are 12 chapters with different stories that the player uh, experiences from 7th grade to 12th grade, and in each one their character needs to make a better choice. They started out making a bad choice, they need to unlock the better decision. And the way they do that is they use their, their skills to find objects in the scene that are relevant to changing their decision and reveal key points about those objects using their skill power. 
And then at the end of each session, oh, these are some other images from stories in our game. At the end of each session, the player gets to see how their character turns out at age 30 based on the choices they've made so far in the game. And they play the game over 12 sessions that span six weeks. So what's unique about our game? Um, well, first of all, so our game, right now we're at about 50% of the way through production. Uh, we uh, hope to be done with a game, um, playable game in hand in uh, November, uh, which will be a part of our clinical trial that we will be running over the next course of the next year or so. Um, and we are focusing on 330 inner city teens um, in New Haven, Connecticut, ages 11 to 14. Uh, with our overall aim in, of this project is to better understand how best to use video game technology to foster positive health behaviors. Um, and what I was saying, and what's unique about our game um, is that we are actually targeting behavior change. So we're going to be following teams for the course of almost two years to see if we're actually able to change their behavior. We're not just trying to change or increase their knowledge. Um, we're actually trying to increase self-efficacy, change social norms, change possibly change attitudes, um, and uh, alter their risk perception. And uh, one way that we're doing this is that uh, through the aspirational avatar, which we're we're trying to create um, some sort of like an intrinsic motivation in the player to get them engaged. And we did this by getting the community involved. Um, the actual kids in the community helped us create this game. And you can see in the pictures here, kids took pictures of their community, and then we actually put that, that was translated directly into the artwork of <coughs> the game. And these are the kids with some of the focus groups that we did um, in pre-production production. production. Okay, a couple real quick things, and then, then we'll be finished. Uh, we're not relying on the head fake. We're not being coy about what we're teaching. Our characters talk about sex. They talk about STDs. Uh, we're being very upfront with the topic, but we're trying to be authentic and compelling, and we're trying to keep the problem solving in the gameplay so that the players are compelled by, by what they're doing inside the game. And part of that is not relying on simple choices. So we're never asking the player, hey, should you do this or not? Because it turns out the kids know what they should do. And instead, we're saying, okay, we, we assume that you know the right choice, but we're going to gate that right choice on you showing, demonstrating that you understand the thought process, you understand the strategy, and you understand how to follow through on what the right choice is so that you can uh, actually execute on that in real life. And that's it. Okay, thoughts? Questions? All right, um, I'll go first. Uh, my first question for you is, um, I see that this is a university in collaboration with Digital Mill and Shell Games. So um, do you have clear roles laid out for each of those different organizations and what they contribute to the project and what, what their deliverables are? Yes, we do. I mean, so Shell Games is responsible for the creation of the actual game itself, the development, um, but a lot of the content is coming directly from the domain expertise at Yale. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about your focus groups and play testing? I mean, I'm Curious about that as well. I'm interested, you know, what you were solving for, and um, you know, was it clarity of the gameplay? Was it authenticity around the language? Uh, it, yeah, I would say it's everything. Um, we actually, before the game even was, we started development. We actually went to the kids and just talked to them, you know, and and with kids this young too, you can't ask them. You can't say, so what's risky in your environment, or what kind of things do you face? So we would actually find concrete ways of trying to get them engaged, to get them talking. Like, we showed them a, a picture of a very benign um, graphic illustration and just said, what's going on here? And when they're talking about the picture, they're actually relating to things in their own life. Like, oh, this girl's pregnant. There was no, no, nothing that showed that this girl was pregnant. But you're like, oh, and then they, they'll tell you more about it. Or um, So we got a lot of, they really engaged and talked to us a lot about what was going on with them. Um, and then as we got a better idea of what the game was, we just kept going back and talking to the kids and talking to them. Um, we did a lot of poster work. We did a lot of visualization where we put a time, we'd make a line on a piece of paper and say, you know, you're 11 now, and here I'm up at 21. Tell me all the things you want to do or plan to do in the next 10 years. And from that, that's how we got a lot of the ideas for the aspirational avatar, because they would tell us the things that were important in their lives. Um, and then with the artwork, anytime we would get anything from Shell, we would take it straight to the kids and get their opinions and feedback. Uh, we also did like a, a photo project. We just sent the kids, sent, sent the kids, sent the kids out with cameras and said, take pictures of, you know, what's going on in your in your life, hairstyles you like, shoes you like, houses you like, cars. 
And then we gave that to the to Shell, and they were able to actually integrate that directly into the game. So it becomes a very authentic and real for them. So what happens if you say you want to go upstairs to the bedroom with the black guy? <laughs> right, so in the game, what, we, what we've chosen to do is we don't offer you that choice. Okay. <laughs> we, assume you, we assume you know, the player knows what the right choice is, especially if a, you know, an adult does here play this game. They know what the game wants them to pick. So we don't make that part of the problem to solve. Because that, that problem is, we're never going to match the emotional valence of a real situation, like why, what would possibly motivate them to choose to go upstairs uh, in, in the game. In real life, it's peer pressure and emotions. They're going to make those risky choices. In our game, we can't motivate them in that way, but what we can do is help them practice. They already know they don't want to go upstairs and get into that risky situation. How can we help them practice uh, the thought process that's going to help them be successful when they get to that situation. Because that, that level of practice, that level of experience with the thought, the thought process prepares them before they even get there to know what to say, how to say it, different ways to say it so that they can refuse without offending if they want to, or aggressive ways to say it if they feel like they need to up the ante given what the situation is. So allowing them to experiment with ways of saying no and being successful at it before they're actually in that situation. I don't, the kids that we're ha having playing, they're 11 to 14. They haven't yet had a lot of these experiences. Our stories go seventh grade to 12th grade, but they will. And so hopefully the, what they experience in the game will give them something to draw on when they're in that experience in real life. So you said you're um, looking to uh, measure the progress on it. How are you going about that? Oh, we're going to be doing assessments. Uh, we're, we're two ways. We're going to be actually, uh, or we're going to be doing assessments with the kids before they play. We're going to do them at, uh, like baseline, we'll do it at six weeks, three months, six months, 12 months, and 24 months. So we'll be actually asking them um, different questions for two years. So we'll be following them for two years. Um, and then we're also um, capturing gameplay as they're playing it. So we'll, we'll be knowing the exact choices that they make within the game. So we'll have a lot of data from the actual gameplay. Mm -hmm. And then you have, are you, then you have a control group of students yes. you're just following for two years? Okay. Yes, so we have 330 kids, um, and half of those will just be playing an off-the-shelf game. Okay. And they'll be playing twice, twice a week, one, in, like one and a quarter hours twice a week for 12 weeks. So it's about, going to be about 15 hours of gameplay. You mentioned that the game makes the assumption that the, the player already knows what the right choice is is and that they want to make the right choice. They just need to find the words to let the other person down easy. Do you have any designs or concepts in mind for future extensions of this project that would be targeted at those who uh, either don't know what the right choice is or actually want to make the wrong choice? Which I would assume is a fair number of the people who do end up making the wrong choice. That it's, it's not just the people who couldn't come up with the quick, uh, sorry, I have to go meet my friend line when they're in a pressure situation. Yeah, and in motivation, it, when we say want to make the right choice, when you're outside of the situation, that's one thing to be asked by an adult, hey, do you think you should have unprotected sex? And pretty much universally, the kids are going to say, no, of course, that's wrong. I would never want to do that. And obviously, those kids don't want to catch, they don't want to get an STD. So that's, I think that's what we, when we say they know the right choice, that's what we mean. But in a, in a real situation, they want to go upstairs, right? It's exciting, it's fun, they like the guy. They're interested in him, so they do want to make that choice in the moment, but take them out of the moment, give them it as, pro propose it as an academic question, then, then they're not motivated by it because the emotion isn't there. So that's what we mean when we say they know what the right choice is, not, not that when they're in the moment they know they shouldn't be doing it. Because when you get caught up in the moment, of course, you, you, know, you don't think about, hey, I shouldn't do this. And so, I think our, our, the strategy of the game is, the premise is we can give them practice beforehand, then when they're in the moment, that will become more of a second nature. And as adults, we, we get that. As, you know, as we have life experiences, we develop second nature um, de decision making when it comes to risk. But for, for the kids, I think they don't have that yet. So this is an abstinent only approach, right? No. Oh no, so you, there, you can go into the bedroom with the guy and yeah. then make smart choices around that. Yeah. In yeah. the story, you do end up having 
sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, okay. And and we focus a lot on understanding the risks associated with that and how to protect yourself. And part of the decisions in the story are choosing to protect yourself when you're in the moment. Uh, and so, so it's not absent. It's is there a, obviously you're just demoing the game, we can't see the whole game and you're halfway through. Is there a balance in terms of the rewards for making the right choices? There, it seems to be a lot of kind of material rewards, nice houses and cars. And are there social status and affirmation and you know that kind of positive feedback in, yeah. in the game? I, I think it was one thing that we got at a lot of the focus groups too with the kids. When we asked them about like the 10 years, what are the things you want to do and be? And these kids, and most, most of them, you know, um, hey, nine out of 10 don't have a dad that lives at home, you know, and they, they live in government housing, and they've got it pretty tough. So the things on their, even when they're 11 years old, the things on their lifeline is to be able, is to make money to, to help my mom pay bills. It's to see my dad, it's to go see my dad, you know, wherever dad is. So, I mean, they have a lot of emotion and things in there. So we, a lot of that is tied directly into the aspiration of Avatar about like who you want to be as a person, like a lot of your values and, and morals. So, um, so just like family is just so important to these kids. So we were able to really pull that in, as well as like mentors um, and important people in their lives. Yeah, some of the questions we asked are like, who do you want to meet? Who is someone you look up to? Uh, what kind of family do you want to have? How many kids do you want to have? And in, in the epilogue of the game, we show how the relationships turned out. So if you, the more you progress in the game, the better your relationships are. So this character, who's the main character, your, your player character's best friend, we show how that relationship grew from the positive life trajectory that you were able to, to unlock and your relationship with the grandmother character and with the parents, the parent characters. Great. I'm really sorry we're out of time, but yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. I'm pleased to present uh, Pop Chilla's World. It's developed by Interbots. Interbots is a startup that creates mobile games and interactive robots to help children with autism. Please welcome Seema Patel, CEO of Interbots. children in the United States will be diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. Um, that number is actually 1 in 54 for boys. And children with autism struggle with a variety of communication and social interaction skills. But they do respond really well to touch screens. Um, something about the transparency and the instant feedback and the tactile interface really resonates with them. And there's been a lot of research in the past few years showing that they have an easier time interacting with robots than with people. One of the things we know about autism is that early intervention is really important. The sooner a child is diagnosed and the more immersive therapy they get into, the greater the chances are they'll learn to overcome some of the symptoms of the disorder. The number we're hearing right now is 100 hours before you'll see a measurable difference in behavior, 100 hours of therapy. 
So our goal is really to create a game or a series of games for this platform that's fun to play for at least 100 hours. And Popchilla's world is all about learning daily routines. So in the game, the child has to help Popchilla, the character, through his morning routines, from waking up, to brushing his teeth, to taking a shower, getting dressed, and heading out the door. And every time they complete a routine, they're rewarded with a little fun mini game. And when they complete all the routines, they're rewarded with an interactive screen of Popchilla at his destination after he leaves the house. So there's, there's a couple of challenges that, that we face. I think our biggest challenge is that we're designing for an audience of children with special needs. And this group of children has a wide range of cognitive and motor control skills. And we really want all of the children to be successful in the game. So one of the ways we're trying to make sure that happens is by having multiple levels of difficulty so that children can advance through the game by touching anywhere on the screen, um, or by touching the correct object in the, in the sequence, or by dragging and dropping the objects to the proper positions in the world. And many children with autism like to perseverate. So for example, in the bedroom scene, they'll repeatedly hit the light switch and watch the lights turn on and off, on and off, on and off. And it's a tricky balance for us wanting to put a lot of feedback into the game um, to engage them to satisfy that need for instant gratification without letting them get caught in these um, cause and effect loops. And, and the other thing we want to do is let them explore and learn in a sandbox environment because at the end of the day, the real world is a sandbox. Um, but that means we have to um, support multiple paths to a solution and we have to be able to recover gracefully when they take step backwards. And those can be difficult things to implement. And in many cases, this game is going to be a tool that parents and therapists use alongside with children. So we have to make sure that we're integrating caregivers into the experience. Um, so we've created some tools that allow them to do basic things like progress tracking and assessment. Um, but we also are making content tools so that they can customize the activities, even create their own activities and share them with other people in the community. And we're still thinking about ways to um, integrate caregivers into this experience and support their needs as well. And I would say that obviously a big challenge is uh, funding and creating a sustainable uh, product. So not just finding the funding to finish developing the game and take it to market, but also making sure that we have the resources to uh, support the game, maintain the game, expand it after it's launched. Um, so we're still trying to figure out what the right revenue model is. Is it in-app purchases for additional caregiver tools and additional activities? Is it a subscription model? Is it a combination of the two? Um, and that's something that we could really use help with um, answering that question. I think that's about it for me. If you know anyone who has a child with autism, they can sign up to be a tester of Popchilla's World on our website, and um, be happy to take any questions. <laughs> okay, you'd mentioned that students with, um, or children with autism, most readily identify with robot characters. So I was wondering how you came about the design of the Popchilla character. Um, emotional expression was number one for the priority because we know that recognizing emotions and um, responding appropriately to another person's current emotional state is something that's really difficult for these children. And so they knew that having an emotionally expressive character was gonna be really important. So um, Popchilla's face is all about emotional expression. Those big ears work like rabbit ears. So they perk up when he's happy and they droop when he's sad. Um, and he also uses his eyelids. They slant kind of like cartoon characters eyelids, and his eyes change color, which is a really powerful cue. So when he's sad, they glow blue. When he's angry, they glow red. And more than that, it was just creating something warm and approachable. We didn't want a hard shell plastic robot. We wanted something that they would want to pet, they'd want to take care of, feed, things like that. Is there any concern about transfer um, where you know, the, the player might have a difficult time translating what they learned about how Pop Chill expresses emotions with red eyes and floppy ears to a human that doesn't have red eyes and floppy ears? Yeah, I think um, transferring skills from the virtual space to the robot and then from the robot to humans is a big concern and something that we're working with, working on right now. And, and I think um, we intentionally went a little bit cartoonish because we wanted the emotions to be really recognizable. And so for us, step one is, can you identify this emotion? And then more importantly, can you react appropriately? If you know Popchilla's sad, 
can you learn to do what you need to do to make him feel better? If you learn that he, if you recognize he's angry, can you make sure you respond appropriately? Sure. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, congratulations. A really well thought out game. Presentation is great. The gameplay makes sense for your target players, but also takes into consideration sort of the co-players in terms of parents. So really great work. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is, how did the Pittsburgh Penguins get involved? Um, <laughs> and my serious question is, you know, autism is a spectrum disorder, and right. you know, there's high-functioning kids and low-functioning kids. You know, do you have any plans to kind of modulate the game a little bit depending on who the player is? Things might be simpler or more straightforward, or you might get more free flips of the light switch before you can't do it anymore. Right. Um, to answer your first question, the Pittsburgh Penguins Foundation actually already does work with children with autism. They have a hockey program for, for kids with autism, and they heard about this project and were really excited about um, supporting us. So um, they've provided a little bit of funding to help us actually translate the game to other platforms in addition to the iPad. And to answer your, your second question, um, we definitely want to serve kids on the entire spectrum. And so in this game, I mentioned briefly the multiple levels of difficulty. It's actually a little bit more complex than that. On the high end of the spectrum, we are planning on implementing a full quest system. So you have to go on quests, you have to achieve tasks, you get more uh, sophisticated rewards and feedback when you do those things. And then on the more severe end of the spectrum, we really anticipate this being used like an interactive storybook. That's the way that parents and therapists practice um, what are called social stories with their children right now. They actually use illustrated picture books. And they'll flip through a book and step one, get dressed. Step two, pack your bag. Step three, get in the car. And you know we've seen how children with autism react really well to the iPad, and we thought there's a better way. You know We can make this interactive. Um, but more so than that, as we create a series of games, the cool thing about this platform is that all of the robot data is actually embedded in the app and is broadcast to the robot wirelessly. So we can create a whole bunch of new content and new games without having to change anything on the robot. And the idea is in the future, we'll target different games to um, children at different spots on the spectrum as well. Thanks. So where are you at now in development and production? Um, we have created a prototype of Popchilla's World, and we're now working on expanding it into a complete game. The goal is to launch that game in the winter of this year, and then um, to launch the data service for parents and therapists sometime early next year. And um, we also have a uh, manufacturing prototype that we've developed of the robot, and are in, in the process of fundraising to actually do a full production run of the robot. You mentioned that you're um creating back-end assessment tools? What kinds of things are you assessing? Right. Um, the, we're still working on the details of that. Actually, we're, we're working with um, the Barber Institute in Erie and the Children's Institute of Pittsburgh, and that's one of the big things that we're talking to them about is what assessment tools are used right now to track progress and um, how can we track similar things in this game. So part of it is trying to adapt the current standards of assessment into the game. And then um, the other part, the part that we're especially excited about, is the content tool. So um, generalization is something that children with autism have difficulty with. So being able to do things like change the color of the toothbrush so it's the same color as your child's toothbrush is really important. And we want to be able to give caregivers that ability. I'm curious, is, is this a competitive space? Are, there, are you racing the market with this? Are there you know, other versions of this game that you're kind of building on? Um, as far as we know, there aren't very many people designing games specifically for children with autism. There are a lot of apps out there that are for neurotypical children that um, many parents and therapists of children with autism will recommend and say can be adapted for use in therapeutic situations. Um, but I think we're one of the first specifically targeting this space. Gives us a little bit of breathing room. <laughs> as you get listed in the app store, what category are you going to list? <laughs> yeah, we've actually already um, released one game for children with autism. It's, um, it's more designed for children on the severe end. This is a little bit more sophisticated. And we listed it under education. And we've actually seen 
Uh, a lot of families of children with autism download it, but also um, families of preschoolers as well, and both of them seem to find value in it, which is really good. Yeah, it seems like with the organizations you have involved, I don't know the amount that you're trying to raise, but possibly even Kickstarter and doing sort of pre-sale uh, method of raising money might be appropriate here. Yeah, and, and I think um, one, of, one of our other difficulties is reaching our target audience. It's a small community, it's a very niche community, and so that's something that we've um, struggled a little bit with in the past, is just getting the word out to the group that we're trying to serve. There's a lot of word of mouth marketing, um, and in breaking through and get, like, getting to that tipping point is, is a little bit difficult. What about Jenny McCarthy? <laughs> yeah, celebrity endorsements would be one way to go. It'd be really great, um, and you know, something that that would be really, really good if we could get. What about the name Popchilla? Um, it was a working name that turned into a final name, and it it was based on the fact that he looks kind of like a chinchilla, and that his tail is very much like a popple's tail, which was a really popular toy in the '80s that we all had, and so the name Popchilla just kind of stuck. Whoa, maybe it was sold. All right, on that note, thank you so much. Great, thank, thank you. you. So our fourth demo is uh, from Zombie Yoga. Zombie Yoga is being developed by Lab 707. They're a group of 18 DePaul students and two graduates. Please help me welcome Doris Roosh, an assistant professor of computing and digital media at DePaul University. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, Zombie Yoga, what is it all about? It's an Xbox Kinect game, single player, and one line pitch, you do yoga poses to fight the undead and other things. <laughs> it is a game, believe it or not, for emotional empowerment, um, because we see this problem here. People with stresses and anxieties, not just if they are giving a talk, and we want to do something about that. And there is a widely known understanding <laughs> that feelings can be indirectly influenced by behavior, meaning doing yoga. Yoga studios are booming. We do a warrior to feel like a warrior. We try to find our inner center by doing a balancing pose. Now, what does zombie yoga has to offer that a yoga class does not? It focuses on only three to four core poses at its core game mechanics. And it's mostly embedding these poses into a fictional context. The idea is that this will reinforce the intended emotional effect of these poses. So you feel even more empowered when you see externalized what is going, what is going to happen. So the fears that you might experience are represented metaphorically as zombies. And if you do a pose to push them aside, you can actually see the effect of the pose on screen. I'm showing you a little video. Um, after this, this is Rick, he has sociophobia, this is our tech demo that we made as a proof of concept, and his biggest problem is going on the subway, because there are people there. So, you're in the subway, this dreadful place, and it should be a subway filled with people, we haven't gotten to that yet, and you wait for your fears, the black karma zombies, to approach you, and you go into a warrior two pose, and you create a path for yourself. So it's all about managing these zombies and these fears. And then you go on, there should be way more zombies, and you do a warrior one pose to create this protective light bubble around you, and your fears just have no other chance as to disperse. All the while, your inner infection, your inner fearfulness is increasing, and it's usually signified by a closing in iris. And you have to manage that as well, so there is an arm sign in the subway train. Couldn't that be possible? Like spray painted graffiti. And you have to do a tree pose where you heal up your inner infection. Okay, so enough of that since we have so little time. <laughs> so after this tech demo, uh, which works quite nicely for a tech demo, we thought, how could we create this into a longer, richer, deeper experience? And we came up with this other crazy idea. 
why not use yoga to connect with your inner child, uh, to liberate your inner child, hmm. and to somehow extend the core mechanics that you have by a thing that we call the light ball mechanic. So the idea of you have an inner light and you can make it grow, and then you can push it around. Push it, yes. And you push it in different directions. Woo! And you have to call it back because this is your faithful companion. You want it with you, and you recharge it by doing that. Ha! And to the side. I skip the other side for time reasons, but I promise it's there. <laughs> Alrighty. So this is a very rough level blockout. It's a spiral. It follows the idea that you can uh, walk walk down the path of your life to your youngest age. So this is this creepy image is your inner child toddler trapped in a really gruesome looking bone cage. And your goal is to foster your inner light and, and push it around to liberate your inner child. How does that work? So you walk down this spiral path and you see these platforms. And on these platforms, there are four different scenes for you prepared. Scenes from your history, like uh, loss, the grandfather scene, or emancipation related to the mother scene, or belonging, the sibling scene, or uh, a strength test we have which relates to an absent father. So we are still developing this, <laughs> but uh, it's informed by a very concrete background narrative, but the themes themselves should resonate more broadly with people. You have to fix core elements, core objects in the scene. It's your mini goal in each scene. And every time you fix one of these scenes, like liberating the bird, which is a representation of you, then a part of the bone cage in the center of the spiral will crack open until the whole inner child is liberated and you are good to go. And you slowly re reveal the background narrative of, um, of this main char character that you play. So our questions to the jury, the judges, however you want to call them nicely, <laughs> are where do you see the strongest potential, biggest challenges for this project? What would you say is the best strategy to get it out there to people who'd benefit from it? I think everyone. But how do you get it out there? And what future could zombie yoga have? <laughs> yeah, this is us, and some of the team is actually here. I'm very happy. <laughs> Okay, um, first question is, is this meant for somebody who is new to yoga or for somebody who already knows yoga and wants to practice? This, um, one of the design principles is, is that it should be very accessible, so we focused on three to four poses. It's three in the first demo level, it's four in the second, and they're very accessible. And we have high tolerance in how to connect, picks up the poses also have to because it's not very good at that. <laughs> but it's very accessible, everybody can pretty much do it unless you have some serious physical limitations. Okay, and I was trying to understand the connection between the, the tech demo that takes place in the subway mm -hmm. for the zombies and the second part, uh, which was a little bit hard for me to follow just because it was pictures, but are those the same game? It's <laughs> You're having this discussion too. <laughs> okay. It is meant to be the same game because you still have some zombies in the spiral there roaming the hallways and represent the resistance you have by accessing a painful memory. So the name still applies and you still do yoga poses. But there are two different levels with two different main characters. And in theory, I'm indulging this notion that there could be an infinite number Nobody wants to buy that, I understand that. But an infinite number of emotional problems based on different characters in different settings where you always use yoga as a means to, to overcome these emotional issues. Okay. I, I mean, I think the concept's really interesting because I, I have tried yoga and it bores the pants off of me, but I think if there were zombies coming in, that would help. But my one concern would be if there, I mean, like you say, the problem that you're trying to address is stress. Obviously, zombies can be somewhat stressed in these. Um, yeah, and, and so, I, one of the things that I wonder is, um, you know, if, if, I, if I reference the survival horror genre, genre I'm thinking of like Resident Evil, for example, typically they're dark at the beginning, they're dark in the middle, and they're dark at the end, and there's never really this sort of progression towards the light, this progression toward a feeling of safety or lessening of anxiety. Is that something that you would engineer into this, pro as, you, as you got closer to your inner child, do you feel a more and more of a sense of empowerment associated with being good at yoga? Yes, absolutely. So the zombies should get less 
on this journey to the inner child because you've overcome so many resistances and unlocked so many painful memories and healed them with your light right. that, yeah, you should feel better eventually, otherwise all the, the therapy is worth nothing. Yep. Uh, also, you're brightening up the level as you go. So with each fixed scene, the, the evocative objects in the scene light up and the zombies were the, these dark, shadowy creatures. When you hit them with the light ball, they go up in black smoke. And then a quick follow-up to that is, how, how do you maintain or even possibly increase the challenge to go from the beginning of the game to the end of the game, while at the same time making it less stressful for the player and moving them toward that goal of being So I think there's, stressful. you're addressing this tension of, is this really, is this a game or not? So you should have this increase in difficulty. We are definitely stretching the definition of game here a little bit, or pushing against it. It's more an experience and it's more about having a goal you work towards and you use a mechanic and we trust the body and in combination with this visualization to have a positive impact on the player. But I don't want this to be constrained by preconceived notions of what a game traditionally is. Uh, really interesting concept. Mashup of two concepts that are both mainstream. I mean, I, I don't have a question so much as, well, I mean, maybe my question is, what's your process for resolving, you know, a bunch of different tensions? You've got, you know, scary, very scary zombies or, you know, cartoony, stylized, you know, fun zombies. You've got, you know, some very subjective, individualized, you know, problems you might be solving for versus, you know, broader, you know, anxieties that, you know, shyness and, you know, those kinds of things versus very specific experiences. Um, within your team and within your development environment, how are you resolving, you know, how are you making these choices? We drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a lot of discussions and, and these are really good questions and there are a lot of uh, conflicting concepts here at work. So there is this idea that, yeah, there should be some humor, so maybe we have a guru that's guiding you through and he has a dry kind of sense of humor and urges you to push through the pain. The zombies should be scary, but they should not be gory, and it shouldn't be too comic -y because it's really about fear and also partly about aggression and working through both of, both of these emotions towards some, some resolution. Um, we discuss a lot, and luckily I have very, very creative and patient team members who bear with me uh, well, I'm trying to figure this out. They help me figure it out too. What, what's the, you know, what's the component? Do you have clinical sort of non-Freudian psychologists on the team that are up to date on? Um, I have a lot of experience with inner child meditation, stuff yeah. like that. I worked with a psychotherapist before on another project called Elude that was a game about depression. So I'm getting some feedback from him. Yeah. But this is not informed by, by very rigorous research. This is informed by more personal experiences, some spiritual practices. But I've been reaching out to a movement therapist in, in Chicago. She's also doing expressive therapy. And it's really so rich in symbolism and ideas. And the, the few players that we showed the concept art so far, they really have strong responses to these very surreal, like the mother represented as a dressmaker's dummy with perfect hair. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just strongly resonating because it shows the emotional distance and like that. So it is more informed by our personal approach than any rigorous studies so far. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, it's great to hear the, that aspect about the movement therapist because my feeling, um, the presentation was really good and I love your energy, it's very infectious, <laughs> which is great, um, is that you, that the, this initial prototype um, or the tech demo of zombie yoga has sort of launched you into another project which I feel like the confines of, of zombies and yoga are restricting you from really going for that other project. That there are those ideas and themes that you explored in that, in that tech demo that you're taking into the project, but maybe um, feeling like you have to hold on to the legacy of the specifics of that tech demo is going to hold the project back. That was sort of my concern in the way you articulated it. Yeah, this today. is so, thank you so much. I mean, you've been debating this. And I just don't know. It is exactly that. Yes, somehow, is it still zombie yoga to get rid of the zombies? <laughs> the title rocks. So what yes. do we do? Right. <laughs> Can we 
just have one zombie in one of the scenes? I don't know. What would you recommend? <laughs> going for the inner child? Well, um, I, I mean, I think that's sort of where uh, Tim was coming from with about the process mm -hmm. and the specific teams. I know that when you were having that dialogue, it made me think of, certainly on, on Flower and Journey, we had moments where you have so many ideas and so many things you're going to cover that we would often in production get to a certain point where you say uh, sometimes exactly this of, you know, we're just going to have to save that for another game. You know, we can't, you can't do everything in uh, one project, right? And, um, and how you go about deciding what the themes are going to be in your project, it's totally up to the, the dynamics of your team and how you guys want to structure yourself and structure the decision-making process. You know, is it uh, you or a small group of people that are sort of making these larger decisions about, okay, we're going to go on this idea and not this idea, or is it, you know, group decision-making or what, you know, whatever that process is, it's sort of um, personal to people negotiate that. I mean, I, I think a lot of it depends on what audience you want to find. I mean, are you making a game for yourselves, or are you making a game for a kind of a niche group, or do you want something with you know broader appeal? Um, you're, you're dealing with two very popular mainstream, you know, con you know, phenomena, and so I think there's you know that suggests that the game will be you know a little more accessible and, and, and broad. I don't know. I also am concerned though that it would hit. It hits nobody, right? Um, because it, it is in this me, weird yeah. middle I, I play place. This game. You play this yeah. game. Yeah, <laughs> like, at yeah. parties. Yeah, but, I'm kind of over zombies, <laughs> um, and I feel like. Uh, but I haven't killed them with Yogi yet, though. <laughs> That's it. Actually, my my question is, what is what is the last fail question look like? All right, go ahead. Quick one. What? What does the fail state look like? The fail state. Oh. Uh, so, in the, so if we are changing the concept radically now, uh, it might look differently because the the closing in iris was a perfect metaphor for the like uh, inner infraction and inner fears taking over. That was the failed state in the subway level. With the inner child level, it might just be plunging into darkness because you cannot. It's very similar, but it's it's still different, and it's this disconnect between your emotions and use, anything that freezes you or whatever. So, but that's cosmetics, like coming up with something that's a nicer, more coherent metaphor with the overall gestalt. Another yes, approach might just, just a quick comment is that, uh, is that maybe you continue on the trajectory of zombie yoga specifically, but as a way of building tools and technology for your, for your other project, right? Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I hope you all enjoyed seeing that breadth and depth of uh, games and interactive experiences that are happening in the Games for Change arena. Thank you again uh, to the judges and also to all the participants. Thank you.